Module 8, Monitoring and Evaluation. Projects and programs should always be evaluated and lessons learned incorporated into new programs. Mr. Howard will start Module 8. In this last session, just talk about monitoring and evaluation. Even when you are doing things badly, even when you are not doing anything, monitoring and evaluation is important. Because we have to go beyond seeing it as a reflection of our own performance, which it is, but it is also a reflection of the performance of our superiors and our government. And they should feel more embarrassed if the monitoring shows lack of performance than you would. And properly used, monitoring and evaluation can help you gain support for improvement. And you can learn, you can of course learn yourselves about what is, what is working and what is not. So what can be measured? What categories can we measure? How do we measure things that relate to outputs that we want and intermediate outcome measures that we want? And how can we inform the community? This is a great way of telling the community in a subtle but important way that we can do better. It's a means of establishing opportunities for performance improvement by government overall, by agencies individually and by departments within agencies. And this is, this is very flexible. Performance indicators, are some, safety performance indicators, are something you can devise to suit your needs. There are some basic safety performance indicators I'll talk about today, but it's a very variable thing. You can come up with indicators that will really help you drive one or two key things you want to do. And uh, you mustn't get overwhelmed by trying to do too much. Start off simply have a few of them, learn how to implement, how to set baseline measures, how to measure change and so on, and then learn how to report that so that you learn from it and those above you learn from it. Safety performance indicators are useful because they reflect an actual safety condition at a point in time. So that's useful in itself. The things you're going to measure shouldn't be the measurement of what you're actually inputting, it should be the measure of the outcome that you're hoping to get, or some intermediate outcome measure. That goes without saying. You don't want to measure, you don't want to measure how many police are out there enforcing traffic because that's a, a, an output. If you've got mean speeds of 60 kilometres an hour out on the street out here today for a whole week, and in the same week next year it's 62 kilometres an hour, we know from our figures yesterday that that means there'll be another 10% of fatalities in that street. Two kilometres an hour, more actually, two, two kilometres an hour in 60 is probably 3%. That's about a 30% increase, um, uh, sorry, a 15% increase in fatalities, three by, three by five. That's the power of intermediate outcome measures looking at change over time. So trends in performance indicator measurement figures measured are very, very useful for you. And another example is drink driving. If you measure the change in police intensity of random breath testing, which you will all get to do in due course if you're not doing it, random breath testing for alcohol of drivers, the minute the police effort falls, fatalities will go up. And the measure does vary depending upon the nature of each country, but it's not quite as consistent as uh, speed, but it's very, very direct. And again, it's measuring the changes over time. Very, very powerful tools. So you can measure current condition, you can measure trend over a number of years, or SPIs could represent a target for performance. You could say our target is to get a mean speed of 55 kilometres an hour in three years' time, or uh, we want to get the number of fatalities involving drink driving as a cause down from 20% to 10% within five years. That sort of thing. One's, a, one's an intermediate outcome measure, mean speeds. Deaths from drink driving is an outcome measure. But I'll talk more about that in a moment. They depend upon a number of factors, relevance, scientific robustness, collaboration, regular, regular analysis and reporting. And 
when you get the information, you've got to be prepared to respond pretty quickly. If it's telling you a, a clear story about what's happening, go and do something. Go and, and if it needs political support, go to your politicians and say, this is what's happening. Our data is just telling us this. We need to move quickly to fix this. You'll probably get support because you've got irrefutable data backing up your insight into what's going on out there. So there are, there are assisting tools, safety performance indicators in assessing your current conditions, monitoring progress, measuring impacts, making comparisons and providing for other purposes. This is a different little, this, is a, this pyramid is different to the triangle we looked at earlier in the week. It's simply saying, here's your social cost, here's your final outcomes, numbers of deaths and serious injuries. Your social cost is the value of statistical life by the number of fatalities and serious injuries. But your final outcomes are deaths and injuries. Intermediate outcomes are those things that are absolutely reliable predictors of death and serious injury. If mean speeds go up by 1%, fatalities will go up by 5%. And there are many others that you can devise. Relationships between seatbelt wearing rates, helmet wearing rates. We know that the risk of being killed on a motorcycle if you wear a helmet is reduced by about 40% if you're wearing a helmet. So in theory, if you have a 100, th uh, 100 deaths a year involving motorcyclists, then if motorcycle wearing, helmet wearing rates go from 50% to 100%, you should get a 40, uh, you should get a 100% uh, a reduction in your levels of death in the motorcycling community. But the point is we can, quanti we can calculate these numbers if you know the representation of motorcycle deaths in your total deaths. So intermediate outcome measures really, really give you an insight into what is going on on your network and help you to plan to counter what is emerging. They'll also tell you how you're going in terms of the things that you've done. So if police have a big campaign to get seatbelt wearing rates lifted, you can look at the number of um, uh, the percentage of seatbelt wearing is an intermediate outcome measure. It should have gone up. If it hasn't, the police aren't doing the task that they say they're doing or they're not doing it as well as they should. And of course, you can then look at the number of deaths in that year where people were not wearing seatbelts and compare that with the year before. So intermediate outcomes, you've then got outputs and that's the number of hours of police enforcement speeding or drink driving or helmet wearing, the number of black spot sites that are treated, the number of kilometres of road that are upgraded based on IRAP rankings. Uh, look, outputs are fairly straightforward. People understand the concept of outputs. They're the things you do to change the situation. But it's that intermediate outcome measures that's a little trickier. This is saying you could actually have intermediate outcome measures by road user groups. I just talked about car occupants with seat belts motorcyclists with helmets, there's two examples. You could have, um, uh, well pedestrian fatalities are an outcome rather than an intermediate outcome measure, but I'll show you some intermediate outcome measures in a moment. And then outputs, you might measure your outputs on a regional basis. One province might be doing a great job of enforcing helmets, another province not, not doing so well, so you need to segment your information. I talked a bit about Cambodia yesterday, Phnom Penh and the rest of Cambodia. Totally different picture. And to have amalgamated them and not seen the differences would have, um, not only would it have blurred the reality, it would have undercut the benefits that were occurring because of enforcement in Phnom Penh. So this is very important to segment your uh, reporting on the basis of, of regions. What to measure and why? As I said, there's a lot of safety indi indicators. There's proven ones that people use, and that's the starting point, but you'll have some particular ones you might want to keep an eye on. But I've talked about them being considered as outcomes, deaths and serious injuries, intermediate outcomes, the things that I've talked about, and then outputs, which is almost like an input, the, the amount of effort that is put into changing something. The outcomes I've talked about, intermediate outcomes I've talked about, outputs I've talked about as well. There's an interesting intermediate outcome measure by the way, look at this. Percentage of high speed traffic on median separated roads. And the Swedes do this very well. Basically their goal is to get 
80% of their two-way traffic onto median separated roads by 2020. And that means there'll be no head-on deaths on those roads. In this environment, it would be terrific to think about assessing how many of your deaths are happening on separate, on the, start with your national highways. What percentage of deaths are happening on unseparated national highways head, from head-on crashes and what percentage are happening on separated, so separated, unseparated. And then set, the road authority can say, we're going to set a target to treat another 500,000 kilometres with a median treatment over the next five years. So that will mean our percentage of uh, deaths from head-on crashes on our national highways will fall. And you can measure, it is, they are quite predictable measures of reductions in death of a certain type. Yeah, I, I like the third dot point there, telling the public what the benefits are. And the public get it more than we'd like to think at times. But only if they're given information. Here's some ex specific examples of performance measures. Intermediate safety outcomes here, average vehicle speeds, front and back safety belt wearing rates, motorcycle helmet wearing rates, drivers and pillions, drug impairment level, skid resistance, road infrastructure, crash safety ratings, that's your IRAP one, two, three, four stars, five stars. That's a performance indicator in itself, intermediate performance indicator. Vehicle compliance with testing standards, crash safety ratings, average emergency medical services response times. I'm sure most of you, uh, uh, most of your governments require their medical authorities to say what the response time is for ambulance services in an emergency. And there are some parts of the ADB region that do this very well in terms of emergency response, very sophisticated call centres and good resourcing and so on. And there are many places that don't do it very well at all. So that's, that's an interesting measure. And if you talk to medical authorities in most countries, uh, some have this sort of uh, metric, measuring response times, but many don't. And recall by targeted audiences is a very important measure of how effective those campaigns are in getting to the t target group you're after. Community attitudes to road safety. So th there's a number of performance indicators, but there's many more. If any good, any robust strategy will model the outputs you need, and it, it will be targeting the outcomes you want to get based on research or from others or from local pilot studies, you will you'll be planning to do a certain amount of, put a certain amount of effort, expenditure into certain things, and you will work out what benefit that should give you in terms of reduced deaths and serious injuries. I won't dwell on this, but this is a little bit of work that we did a couple of years ago for a state in, in Australia, for Queensland actually, and they're the outputs, so the sorts of things you do, they're the, the agencies that do it, and they're the sorts of resources you put in, the effort you put in. Then there's delivery of strategy under the pillars, and these are the intermediate outcomes you measure for, uh, for example, intersections, runoff road crashes, head-on crashes by crash type, by road user groups, and by some other behaviours. And then your final outcomes relate to deaths and serious injuries. Don't want to confuse the issue by putting that there, but I think I put it there to say there, this is a long journey, safety performance indicators. You are not going to move into this space tomorrow. But think about a couple of very simple performance indicators that you can have. You've got the 50% reduction target by 2020. Many of you have adopted that. That's an outcome measure. But think of a couple of intermediate outcome measures that will really drive that change. If vulnerable road users are the biggest, biggest, and they are, vulnerable road users in every country here are the biggest issue. So what are the things that cause problems for pedestrians? Well, speed is the big killer of pedestrians, speed of traffic. What about a performance indicator that you say to every local government, in each city we want you to measure changes in mean speed over the next 12 months. And we'd like to see you get that down, get that down in urban areas to no more than 30 kilometres an hour. But tell us what the change is anyway. Really important way of getting your pedestrian deaths down, and it would get down your motorcycle deaths too. One of the things that we measured in Victoria, still do, is mean speeds. 
and this was in our 60 kilometre an hour zones. You can see over a number of years we measured what happened when we really tightened up on enforcement. And the, the mean, the blue line is the mean speeds, you can see how it came in the 60 kilometre zone, 63 down slowly to less than 60 over about five years. It took a lot of effort with enforcement, public campaigns, uh, increased fine levels, increased cameras, uh, suspension if you were 25 kilometres an hour. So very, very active program of measures to get the speeds down. So that's what happened with speeds. This is an actual case study of what happened with speed. This is output and final outcome data. So there's outputs, that's the number of speeding infringement tickets issued by police over that period, the red line. And the blue line is fatalities, levels of fatalities. There's the number of fatalities, here's the number of infringements. We worked with police and the police introduced really tougher enforcement around about this, oh, sorry, at this point. They increased enforcement of speed lower thresholds of tolerance, more cameras, more hours, tougher penalties and so on. Well, there were about 50,000 infringements a month being issued. They went from 50,000 a month to 100,000 a month. Can you imagine the excitement in our community? Can you imagine the media? Everybody was, it was, everyone was talking about this. There was a lot of unhappiness. We're all getting tickets for speeding. This is not good dreadful and there's no road safety benefit and it's just raising revenue. Well, here's what happened to fatalities. They went from about 460 down to 325. Virtually all in the 60 kilometre an hour zones in metropolitan Melbourne because that's where the cameras could be more effective and that's where the death reductions occurred. So I showed you a minute ago reductions in mean speeds here is the increased outputs, the red line of infringements, which tailed away, by the way, as behaviour modified, which you, you hope will happen. And look at the outcomes. I've put the three things in together at slightly different scales. There's the outcomes, fatalities. There's the output, which is infringements issued. And here's the mean speeds. Now, as the mean speeds have gone down, the fatalities have collapsed. And that's just not something that's nice to see and might happen. That will always happen. Whenever you reduce mean speeds on any road, anywhere in the world, you will get a reduction in deaths and serious injuries. 1% reduction in mean speeds, 5% reduction in deaths. What a terrible equation that is. You know, it's the sensitivity of road deaths to kinetic energy levels is extraordinary. So there's an example of, using, of, of the three parameters, the three safety performance indicators. Outputs, final outcomes, intermediate outcomes. And I've got a few examples of safety performance indicators in these slides and in your workbook, which you can look at at your leisure. And th these are not something you'll be doing anytime soon, but it gives you an idea of what's possible. The proportion of the national highway network that is three star or four star, all of you could aspire to do that in the next couple of years, if you get some IRAP measurement going of your highway network. Very good thing to be able to say to your politicians. We have 20% of our network that's four star, Malaysia has 70% of its network that's four star. I don't know what the figures are, but you know what I mean. You can, you, you, it, it gives you something measurable to compare with others. Very useful. Safer vehicles, there's a whole lot of intermediate, in, uh, intermediate outcome indicators you could use. There it is, the sales of five car, five star end cap standard vehicles compared with the previous 12 months measured every quarter. And that's something that your transport departments should be establishing, that measure. You might publish it, your governments might, mightn't let you publish it, but it's very powerful if you know what those facts are. You have a position of knowledge and you can predict what's going on.
One of the other things we did in Victoria was to measure compliance with speed limits as measured at speed cameras. And if you look at this little graphic, just ignore this blue line for a moment. The red line is the proportion of drivers who are offending. In other words, they are seven kilometres an hour or more over the speed limit. And look how that has fallen during, a, during intense enforcement from 2% of drivers down to less than 1%. So it halved the number of drivers who were exceeding the speed limit. Really valuable information to have. Police collect that information. They made that available to all the road safety partners so we could discuss it, be aware of it, talk about it. Talked about monitoring trends. Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? Are we stagnant? And I've talked about this as well. This is just an example of the sort of the way you can use measured outcomes to tell you what is really happening. This is over a number of years serious casualties on the state highway network in Victoria. That's the total number of serious casualties over time. That's going down at about 12% from 2003 to 2007. So the, the, the trend is good. But in that period, we had spent a lot of money on roadside barriers to prevent runoff road crashes becoming serious or fatal. So we measured as well what was happening to a subset of that, what was happening to runoff the runoff road crashes on a hundred kilometre an hour country roads. So that's all roads, but this is the 100 kilometre an hour country roads where we had concentrated our investment. And of course, pleasingly, the trend was even more positive. There was a bigger reduction on those roads than on the roads generally. Don't want to dwell on that in too much detail, but there's a lot of information you can generate from your own crash data sources if you think about what you're trying to measure, if you think about what it is you want to demonstrate to your politicians. Evaluation, of course, is crucial. Everything that you do as a project or program should be evaluated because it gives you an understanding of where it could be strengthened, where it could be better, but it also enables you to say to your political masters and your superiors, this program was a success, this program was of limited success, but we now know what we need to do to make it better, and so on. Really, really important. Evaluation is never important for its own sake. It's important for what it enables you to do in a management sense. You might need case control, so areas that aren't affected by your work to see how it compares with the area that you are treating it. Researchers know all about that. So build it into your programs from the outset. Evaluation is your friend. Never be, a f never be fearful about evaluation. And, and what it will tell you. And that last point, try and tell the public about the results. We found when we did evaluations of programs, the public were vitally interested in hearing how they'd gone, really interested. Big graduated licensing program to improve, make it a little harder for young people to get their license, getting hours of practice, going through tests, four year probationary period, we were worried about the number of young people being killed in the first year of driving. Terrible number of deaths in that first year. It falls away fairly quickly. So this new graduated licensing system was put in place. The evaluation showed a 31% reduction in serious injuries, serious casualties, in the first 12 months of driving as a result of that program. The program took seven years to put in place. It's given us a 31% reduction in deaths and serious injuries for young drivers in their first year of driving. Now these are, these are terrific results. A credit to all the people who did all the work, who did all the hard work of selling the program, setting up all the measures, bringing in new license tests that really checked if the kids had experience. Very important. The Swedes, performance indicator. I, I want you folk to know what Best in, best in class is doing, because that's where you're going. You're going to this, we all will hope, as soon as you can, but that's where you're headed. By 2015, 90% of traffic on roads with speed limits over 90 kilometres an hour and greater than 3,500 vehicles a day shall be separated. So that's the median argument I talked about before. 70% of traffic shall be separated on all larger state roads, and mean travel speeds will be reduced by 6 kilometres an hour on state road network 
excluding the roads where you can't have a head-on crash and where you're protected from running off the road with barriers as well. Like the German Autobahn argument. If you're on a German Autobahn, you can travel at a very high speed because you can't have a head-on, you can't have a runoff road, you can't have an intersection crash and there are no pedestrians to hit. But the Swedes are saying, OK, so on those good roads, that's, that's fine, but where we don't have those conditions, we've got to get our mean travel speeds down by six kilometres an hour, under 70 kilometres an hour, so people aren't killed in the event of a head-on. It's all entirely logical, but it's a long journey to get the thinking in place behind this that will drive the change you need. Oh, and that was the other thing. By 2010, half of all new company cars were to have alcohol interlocks. Long winters, vodka's a big problem, drink driving's been a big problem in the Scandinavian countries. An alcohol interlock, to start the ignition of a car, if you have one of these fitted, you've got to blow into it. And if you've been, if you've been drinking, it won't start. It won't start the car, it won't let you start the car. And in Australia, in Victoria, we introduced alcohol interlock programs in 2003. And the government's actually just announced a very big extension. Anyone getting a drink driving offence now and losing their licence must fit an interlock for at least six months when they get their licence suspension period served. So what we know is it breaks the nexus between drinking and driving. If you want to drive, you can't have had a drink if you've got an interlock fitted. So that's, that's alcohol interlocks. They're a pretty positive tool. The only problem is that when, if people do serve their time with an alcohol interlock and then they go to the court and the court sees the records about whether they tried to get around it or start it incorrectly, if they've been good boys or girls, they get their licence back without the interlock, then there's a, a risk that if they're alcoholics they'll go back to drinking and driving. Would do that to put a drunk person at risk. And the experience shows it doesn't happen. <laughs> so it's, it's quite a... I've had one fitted in my car, not that it was mandatory, but I, I had one fitted to try it out. And it's pretty easy to do. I, I've left my car, actually, at a, at a parking station, and the, when I came back, the attendant had shifted it. I said, how did you start the car? Oh, he said, I saw this thing there, and I blew it and started. So it's fairly natural, you know, people work it out. This is a very good countermeasure for drink driving. And, you've, and we've, we know that there are many alcoholics who drive. And really, some alcoholics will be on these forever. But it's a way of stopping drinking and driving. And families think it's great. Wives, children, they think it's a very good thing if Dad's on an interlock if he's a drunk. It stops him killing people. So. You've got to work out what safety performance indicators you want to introduce. That, that's up to you. There's, there's a lot to, lot to think about. Think about what data you can get hold of. But above all else, I'd encourage you to do something. Set up a couple. Set up a couple of indicators and measure them. And you'll get a great deal out of that. And what, what you'll get out of it is, is the incredible feeling of a capacity to understand what's happening. It's really quite powerful and quite instructive and you realise that the biggest limitation to knowledge about what's happening on the road network is you. You need to do more to understand what's happening. There's a lot of ways in which you can get the data. There's crash data, there's hospital data, there's survey data. You can go out and survey seatbelt wearing rates outside in the street right now. We could stand there and count the proportion of people wearing seatbelts in the front and back and that's how those surveys are done. We could do the same with helmets and so on. With speed, we'd have to go out with laser guns, hide behind a pole so they didn't, they didn't think we were police and get the measurements of speeds as they went past, record it, come back in 12 months and see what had happened. It'd be very interesting. You need to measure, you need to get representative samples. There's a, a lot of work on that.